Hi, I'm your moderator for this conversation on how an open approach to DevOps gives you flexibility to adapt to anything. But in my day job, I'm a partner engineer. I get to work with uh, the likes of GitLab and JFrog and Sneak in, in, in helping build integration so that we can all tie our, our tools together. And so uh, that's how I get to know the, the, my, my panel joining me today. And I'll open up with, with some questions just about how each of us got here, how, how we got to this point where uh, the, you know, there's a, 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 a tool chain that everybody's trying to get to or, or, or some way of thinking about how all of these things fit together that still feels a bit difficult. And uh, I think vendors like ourselves have all been promising uh, integration for years, decades even. And I just kind of want to know like, yeah, wh why are we in this situation? So I'll start with Patrick Dooley, who I work with over at GitLab. We've been working on uh, integration between GitLab and Jira for a good, a good year now. And uh, and, and Patrick, I know you, you have some background with, with Rackspace and in the design world. So you really understand how users want to do things. Um, so, so plug those things together. How, how is your journey connected up to understanding how all of these tools fit together? Yeah, I, I started my, my IT and software dev journey about 15 years ago, managing free BSD servers. Um, I worked at a little DC and we managed some servers. I built a ton of software. I went and worked at Rackspace for a number of years. I'm now in, in GitLab where I get to play with some of these really modern tools, but the, the world has changed dramatically. And if you roll the clock back that far, um, managing, managing hardware and managing software back then was, was a lot more painful. It was a lot more difficult. And I spent a ton of time writing scripts and, and making shell scripts and things that would automate tasks Right, like I, I had all of this uh, that back then it was a ton of migration from like from or two different Apache servers and like writing all of that stuff was really hard. And over time we've seen things like application lifecycle management platforms started to grow, I guess about eight years ago, nine years ago. Um, and now we have these modern DevOps platforms that have really changed the way that we approach things. And there's from a design, I like that you bring up the design standpoint, like the user experience of managing software, deploying software, testing software has increased so dramatically over that time. And today's world, um, writing secure software that is well tested, that is uh, maybe like that you're sure that it's well tested both on the back end from performance for performance or security and from the front end, like it'll render appropriately in a, in a mobile browser. Like the ability to do that these days has gotten so much easier and it's so crucial to making better and better tools um, and better and better software tooling. Yeah, thanks. So I'll switch over to Patrick Dubois now. We, you, you've been on this journey since, uh, you know, since way back. Your early writing certainly inspired me. And uh, you know, so, so from, from DevOps days now to sneak, there's uh, there's quite a journey there, and and so you're also ending up at a you know out of the community and in, into a vendor. Tell us a bit about that journey and what it's taught you about the tool chain. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Like uh, like you said, I go way back, and when I started earlier, I was very close to the agile world and the XP teams, like the collaboration and people working together. Um, but at the same time, I was a sit admin kind of looking at virtualization and automation and, and making things more agile and, you know, in the agile infrastructure space. Um, I think I've, I've, I've just seen it evolve, right, to um, people saying uh, there's a cultural aspect, people collaborating, getting better along uh, the same way. And then at the same time, scaling up their their tool set to, you know, make it more reliable at the same time. So. Uh, over the years, I've seen both go hand in hand. And if you're just doing one, it's probably going to be limited in impact. And one kind of influences each other. Um, the, the way that I ended up in Sneak on security is that um, we've been promoting DevOps in general. And I've seen all buzzwords like front end ops, no ops, you know, every kind of ops, star ops. It's like I've seen everything. Um, I think what's interesting with, with DevSecOps for me is that um, a lot was about the stability and kind of making sure everything was reliable. Um, in the security space, there's an interesting angle, which is about the risk. So you don't immediately see it 
as being valuable because you know it might not fail but but it has a different angle and and i get asked by people saying you know isn't devsecops the same as devops and and they're right right and and devops is the same as agile and you know we, we kind of go back and you know it, it doesn't really matter what i do think about these terms is how they act as a label to kind of get the stories out onto the world and to kind of like have people surface the practices and that's why I think currently DevSecOps in the, is in that kind of uh, level where there's an emerging ideas of what can we do, how can we progress the field. I'm not saying we're there yet, and definitely you know there's loads of space for more tools. Uh, but again, we see the same cultural shift happening in security. How can we own the trust? How can we kind of get these two groups collaborating? How did I get to care about the same thing, which is kind of like serve the customers, get better at it and kind of making it more fun. And that's maybe like my last point on it. Like people have thanked me in their career that they kind of enjoyed being this and they were treated as a better being. Uh, and the side, that was a side effect of creating some space by automation, some tools, but you know, my genuine interest is you know making people you know having more fun while they deliver more value. So now, Melissa, I know you've you've been a developer for for uh, at least ten years, and uh, you have experience in all kinds of team sizes and uh, and in the enterprise where I think these tool problems must uh, emerge the most. So so maybe you can tell us a bit about your journey and your understanding of the tool chain. Definitely. So yeah, I, I am a developer through and through. That's how I started. Um, and it's actually been 20 years, if you can believe it or not. I'm going to age myself a little bit here. Um, I started out just doing, you know, regular uh, web app development um, to start with. Uh, some, of, some of that was self-taught. I was also going to school. Um, but my first job, and I have to tell you this experience because um, it just it's, it's really interesting how DevOps um, has been around for a long time. And it's interesting to me that just now it's it's becoming more of a of a common term that everyone uses, but not everyone yet really understands what it is or what it all entails. So I had a really fortunate experience. I was fresh out of school. Um, actually, I started this position as an intern. And this was my first experience with with uh, CI CD, right? With even just um, um, integration and I, I had focused so much on just improving my development skills. My background is in Java. And uh, I, I was working on this particular project. And that's what I thought was important. That's all I needed to do. Um, but that's not the case. This team was a very, very small team. I have really good memories of this team. Um, my first uh, CI CD experience we had a build server in a tiny little room off the side of our office. And we attached to it a siren so that anytime someone checked in code without running tests or anything, that siren would go off and the whole office would know. It was pretty, pretty uh, interesting <laughs> introduction to, um, you know, really paying attention to the quality of your work, making sure you're following the process, making sure you're actually running tests before committing, making sure you've done, you know, code review, that kind of stuff. I loved that experience. Um, that's when it occurred to me, there's a heck of a lot more going on here than just coding. There's a lot more to this process from development to delivery. It's not just write the code and that's it, you're done. That's not how it works. So, um, Fast forward, I've, I've been with JFrag now for a year. Um, prior to that, I was on a, a couple of teams that had um, integrated DevOps methodologies into the day-to-day. -day. And I remember uh, coming from my development background, how overwhelming it was for me uh, to realize and have my eyes opened to how many sets of tools there are involved in getting this software out to production. Um, especially conversations when we, we added you know, ops counterparts to our team. So we were all together and we're able to communicate with each other. I was in, I had no idea. I, I, it turns out I made different decisions as a developer with coding the software when I understood how my software was actually being packaged and delivered to production. Um, having that communication, that flow from ops to dev, it, it really made things a little easier for us, made us understand where 
um, automation would be beneficial, uh, made us understand how designing the product was going to make a difference, especially when it came to um, diving into microservices, scaling our services differently, um, observability, that was overwhelming for me too. Uh, now I was responsible to understand not only how my product worked, but how it was used by the general public. You know, where was load? What times of day were, were busiest? How would we need to uh, redevelop certain parts or certain features of this product so that it would behave better live? Um, all of these things have been an incredible experience for me. And um, I, I love working with JFrog. I just um, had my year anniversary here um, as a developer advocate. And it was a perfect move for me because just diving into DevOps, and this was a company where DevOps was important and the experience of the developer is important. So that's my story. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Melissa. I don't think I've ever had such high stakes continuous integration. The worst was just a <laughs> fireman's hat, right? Like, so it's kind of same thing, but, but fireman's hat isn't quite as bad as the siren. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, from, from, from Atlassian's perspective, we, we ran a survey a, a, a couple of years ago and we were asking people in, in kind of like, you know, our Jira centric way of thinking, how many tools does it take to, uh, to figure out the status of a, of a project? And over a couple year period where we ran this survey, we saw a steep increase from uh, the median being around three to five tools. And, 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 and now, uh, you know, like as of 2020, uh, we're seeing a lot more people saying it's five plus tools to figure out what is going on. So, so at, for, for Atlassian, we've kind of embraced this idea that we really have to uh, help pull all this information together. We can't just keep insisting, oh, just just look in Jira. It's it's just not reality. So, um, so if that's kind of what what we're thinking about open, I, I wonder if uh, if the rest of you are also thinking about an open approach, and uh, and maybe we'll start with Melissa this time. Can can you tell us what what you guys are thinking in terms of an open approach and how that helps with this tool chain problem? Yes, definitely. Um, this is definitely a challenge. Uh, the tools are a challenge. Um, there's a multitude of tools across the delivery cycle. You've got tools for different software languages, for different application types, for different environments, um, so on and so on. It can be pretty challenging for an enterprise org to integrate all of these seamlessly. And um, so I think, especially with JFrog, what our idea of open means is that we integrate with several tools in, the, in your tool chain in order to make your life easier. Um, one, one really good example of that is we provide uh, build information. Uh, this is uh, like all of the metadata that it's collected during the software delivery process. And this is really valuable for observability. You can observe stuff like uh, what software exactly was delivered to production, which packages, uh, what builds failed, what bugs and features were fixed. Uh, we also provide, you know, REST APIs and plug-in extension frameworks so that our products can make it easier for our customers and partners to connect their tools. Uh, we provide a bunch of developer and documentation and support. Um, all of this is free, readily available. Um, this is super important because back to my story of when I first joined a DevOps team, all of these tools were really overwhelming. And what really made the difference is that we were able to use the skill set that was available on the team. It's not necessary to learn every single tool out there, right? But you have your skill set, and it's really efficient if you can pull from what you already know and be able to put those pieces together without constantly having to learn something new. So being having this open atmosphere and being able to integrate with a variety of different tools, I think. It's really important for DevOps products in this space is so that developers and ops um, people can put all of their skill sets together and be able to uh, be successful. So over on the sneak side, what's what does what does open mean over in, in the context of DevSecOps? Well, I, I guess the most appropriate way to kind of explain this is uh, you know, we all use a lot of open source, right? And we, we talk about it being open to the world. Um, but what we see actually when we, we look at the code, then we're uh, looking for that it can help us in our daily job. And 
And I would say this is a step of showing how competent you are, right? You should look at the code, how well is it being done? But that alone, kind of sharing that aspect, you know, and I, 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 I uh, kind of compare that to sharing an API and making sure somebody can use it, is not enough in these days. We, we not just look at the code or the quality of the work, we also look whether, um, the community that is around it is actually sincere that they do what they want to do uh, and, and that they say, you know, it's consistent with what they're doing. So this kind of like, as a vendor, you want to be consistent of, hey, I'm going to do this and then you need to do it in a way. So it's not just sharing as I threw it away. Then comes the next part, you want to be reliable. So you want to have when you update your uh, API. You want to make sure that things are not breaking <laughs> and, and, and it's reliable. It, somebody can build on this, you know, make it a rock solid business. They don't have to worry about it. And then as the last part is this, do you really care? And as a vendor, you can show that you're actually uh, care about the user problem. If the user finds that you're actually helping him with the job itself. So if they're adding things to their API, you're never using, you're like, huh? Like what direction are they going? Are you really sure? So in a nutshell, I, I just named four kind of areas that very much relate to building trust. And as a vendor, we sometimes forget that it, it is not about like, you know, people have to trust us and we're doing all this cool stuff. I think our job is to become trustworthy and similar to an open source project that has to earn your trust. And I, I think that that is how we try to approach things. Like we, we, we try to go over these four areas. So people are, we are transparent, whether they can trust us or not, we're in there for the long run and we're really helping them uh, with their problems they have daily. Yeah, well, I, I without you know, with the mention of open source, I immediately am looking at Mr. Dooley over here, <laughs> thinking about GitLab. Well, what's but but you know, is is open source the extent to which uh, GitLab thinks about open? Uh, no, no, uh, yeah. Th so there are there are kind of two pieces to it. One, yeah, we're we're an open core project. Um, we have uh, a community of over three thousand contributors who actively participate in building GitLab, and that's that's. That's the contributors alone is double the size of our company, right? Like that's way more than just our engineering team works on GitLab. And and furthermore, the our customers themselves are are making improvements and changes. And and it's not just like they fixed a bug that they ran into. It's sometimes contributing new features that are key to their teams, uh, which is really cool. Because like we've got to serve the whole community. But when an individual customer says, actually, I really need this feature. I get that it's not important to you. And I get that it's not important to your other broader customers, but like, I want it, so I'm making it. Um, and that's a really cool feeling. Like we, we get to see things come in that uh, otherwise we would have never built. Um, so that's that's really exciting. And I'm, uh, I just happen to be wearing my EFF hoodie daily. I'm really into open source in general. Um, I'm a firm believer in right to repair. I, I think you should be able to look under the hood. Um, I like Patrick's point about building trust. And, and for me, as both an engineer and, and as a part of an open, open source project, um, I think it's important to be able to look under the hood. And when I'm running mission critical code and I'm running it in production and it's important to me, I, I think it's really key to be able to look under the hood, see exactly how something is working, see exactly why uh, an exception may be happening or why an error may, getting, may be getting thrown. Um, I think that's really important, uh, and I think that's that's kind of a one of the core theses that that we we stand behind that is really important to our customers. Um, I think the other piece of it, a little bit contrary to the the thesis of the the panel, right? Like GitLab believes that you can have a single tool that crosses all of your tool chain, and like I don't want to talk about that, but the the idea is that if all your tools are right next to each other, like that's the best possible experience. And so the corollary is. If all of your tools are totally disconnected and they don't talk to each other and they don't, they're not interoperable and they speak different languages and like you're locked in to one or the other, um, that's the worst possible experience. Like that will make your life the worst. Like if best possible is everything in the kitchen sink and one thing, worst possible is everything only does like one thing and refuses to talk to anything else. And so 
GitLab, uh, it's in our, I actually wrote it. It's in our, our, product, uh, our product handbook. Um, we should play nice with others. And so GitLab's platform, like, yes, we think we can solve all of your problems, but that's not actually the case. I have a ton of customers using Sneak. I have customers using JFrog. Like, that's fantastic. And I want you to use the tools that are best for your team. And so we, we work really hard. That is exactly what my team is doing right now with Jira. And like, we're working with Ian and his team on, on integrating more Jira things, because if you want to use Jira, you should be using Jira. And that's really important. It's... Um, I think open in the context of DevOps is it's totally right in that a, a single DevOps tool cannot solve everyone's problem in every single scenario, in every case for everyone's compliance needs and everyone's specific regulatory needs or whatever, right? Like you need to be able to integrate the tools that work best for your company, for your team, for your customers, et cetera. So I don't know, I think open has a, a few different meanings and we're very into it in general. Yeah, so I think, okay, so if we're getting to, as, as a community, as a community of vendors, if we're getting to playing nice with others, if we're becoming more trustworthy, and we, we all of us have these open APIs that have allowed us to build integrations with each other, I, I'm kind of wondering, like, well, well what's next? Is, is there going to, you know, are, are people going to find other problems as they, uh, as, as they try to increase their deployment speeds and, and, and become more reliable? Uh, uh, Patrick, let me, let me flip that right back to you uh, at GitLab. What are you guys kind of thinking about as next? I mean, next, that's a tough one, right? Um, like we talked, I, I mentioned earlier, like ALM platforms. Um, if you took like a best in breed ALM platform uh, back when that was really the gold standard uh, and you you know brought it forward into the future and then stuck a serverless, a serverless function in front of it, it would just fall over, right? Like there's always going to be this march of progress. I can't tell you, I don't think anyone can tell you like what, what will be the next major revolution in deploying technology or, or writing software or deploying it or managing it? Like, I don't think we know. Um, I don't, uh, I think a lot of people like to hand wave and say like, it's machine learning, but like, that's not I, okay. And like, there's a lot that could happen. And I, I don't know. Um, I'm sure that there is some brilliant engineer out there right now working on what the future will look like. And, and it's our challenge uh, as vendors of development tools and deployment tools, um, we're going to have to just wait and see what comes around the pike and see what, what customers want to use. And we have to adapt to that. Um, and that's, that is a continuous challenge that that's kind of the thing that makes this space so exciting for people who work in tooling like this. It's always what creative and interesting and amazing technologies have come up and how do we deal with that? And how do we make that work uh, for our customers and help them benefit their teams and, and their, their tool chain? So I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know. And I'm excited to see what it is. <laughs> I see, you know, you're, but, but your mention about the, you know, you put the serverless function in front of people. And I keep wondering, like, you know, our industry has this history of these sort of rapid swings back in one way or the other. And, uh, you know, what, what's going to bring us back to the, you know, the monolith and the mainframe? I, I, I don't know. I'm, you know, I'm, it's not that I'm hoping it. Uh, but anyway, just, you know, we have these weird swings. Oh. On that front, I have been saying for years, like I've, I've got money on a, a long bet that Big Iron's coming back. Right? <laughs> People make fun of me, but like, I, I bet you yeah. at some point, yeah, we're gonna get back to it. Just like clusters were a thing. Yeah. Like anybody remember Beowulf clusters back in the oh, day? Yeah. Like it was a thing sure, sure. and we left it and we're coming back to it. Like, yeah, it's cyclical. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I um, Mr. Dubois, I don't know if, if it's, uh, you know, if it's me just projecting, but I kind of feel like DevSecOps isn't solved yet. The security still has quite a ways to go. Uh, do, do you think that's, you know, is, is that true or is, or is there something else that's kind of next in this, uh, in this journey? Well, there's a couple of things. I, I, I first want to like build on top of that you know, the serverless uh, sure, sure. Like thing. Uh, I think we're moving into and, and when the first serverless came out, um, I, I dubbed it that we're going to into a service full architecture. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not talking about the microservices internally in your company. Uh, we're more and more relying on external companies to take li heavy lifting, you know, partners like us, they, we, we take care about stuff that businesses need, 
but it's not their core business anymore. They want to focus on their domain. And uh, I've, I've seen kind of firsthand how this happened in the mobile space and it kind of, it, it is expanding. And what's interesting is that you, you, your mind just shifts on where you operate and what is important. And, and, and that's where, uh, again, building the trust is, is hard. We're not sitting together anymore in one room. We're talking to a vendor. So like, is this the end of DevOps? I used to say, like, give me an API and then we're done. Um, I learned that, again, the telltale signs of the uh, company on the other side will, will probably kind of help us uh, to whether, you know, they're talking at a, a webinar like this or a conference, uh, they're writing a postmortem, they're doing something else. We, we kind of see the hints on how they do this, how their well their support cares about us. Um, and given that we're ha starting to have these more of disposable services, we haven't invested in them, we just paid them some money. I've seen the architectural discussions go from continuous integration, continuous delivery, and then it was almost like continuous re-architecturing, right? Because we don't have to build and deliver any more of those. We're just gonna swap in, out, in, out, whenever we find a vendor that matches what we need at this time. Oh, there's another vendor that matches us. And obviously, you know, the more one vendor kind of solves our problems, that, that, that kind of makes sense. And coming back then to the, the security space not being solved. Yes, there's an explosion of tools, right? Because it, it's like everybody wants to have their startup and kind of build on that. We're starting to see some consolidation. I'm really proud that Sneak is actually able to spend multiple layers now where we're adding value instead of just like the one niche uh, you know, it's going to be the code, it's the container, it's the Kubernetes, it's the cloud, you know, they all kind of need security. Um, but then on the flip side, we're also expanding into operational security, making sure, you know, people get a better sense, uh, helping people get better. So that world will just keep expanding because it's, it isn't that mature yet, uh, but it is exciting, uh, you know. Hey, I, Melissa, you know, I, I think speaking of expansion, I know JFrog has been expanding quite a bit over the years. Uh, what, but where do you see sort of the next frontier? Where, where are things going from there? So um, something that Patrick Dooley said really, really struck me. Um, I've done a talk in the past about service mesh and just, you know, teaching people what it is, why you need it. Um, the advance of microservices and how, you know, how that introduces a whole nother set of issues that now you need to solve. So this whole movement, and I, I swear it may be every 10 years that this happens, we move away from a particular ideology and then we go back to it. So we've, we've moved away from monoliths and we specialize. And then I, I really do see us moving back together again. And I, I see this with the DevOps tool set too, right? I mean, you have a bunch of DevOps tools out there that do something specific. And now we see this surge in tools that are like, to come to us, we'll take care of everything for you from beginning to end. And I see that continuing um, as people learn more and they get more involved in their teams, they, they have more education behind them. When we get new people on our teams and, and they just need to learn one thing, you know, which, which tool are they gonna pick first? What are they gonna learn first? The one that will meet all of their needs for the short term at the very least, or are they gonna immediately jump in and try to learn 10 different new things? Yeah, thanks, Melissa. So on that note, I wonder if we could all get a quick round of what's the next thing that people should do tomorrow to be uh, to be practical. So what's the one piece of advice that you have, Patrick Dooley? Yeah, it's uh, a common refrain for me is choose your tools wisely. You have more than a hammer and not everything is a nail. So that means not everything needs to be a microservice, not everything needs to be a monolith or a serverless function or whatever. Don't let habit define the way in which you tackle your next challenge. Tiffy. Melissa. I am 100% with Patrick Dooley on this. Um, definitely choose your tools carefully, but keep in mind the, what your skill sets are on your team. You've got valuable people at, you know, willing to work, wanting to get their products out there, wanting to get this software um, out there successfully. Use what they know. And in saying that, um, 
you're likely going to be choosing the leaders in the DevOps space. They're leaders for a reason. Uh, they have the integrations available to work with a variety of tool sets. They have the history, the, the technical innovation, and the resources to work with all of these tools. Um, identify what those are for your team and go forth and produce. <laughs> Thanks for the thought, Melissa. And for the final words, Patrick. Yeah, I think you know people have explained that we're going for the tools. We're looking at having a good tool set, how it's being used. Um, if there's one thing I would have changed on DevOps is that I would have tagged on the level of business in there. So we're actually focusing every time when we choose a tool, like how does it help ourselves? How does it help the team? And how does it help the business? And, and kind of make those three uh, differentiations when you select something. Because something might be really fun for you to work on, not so great for the team and definitely too costly for the whole enterprise. So kind of keep in mind all those three levels when selecting a tool. Excellent. Oh, thank you all panel. It's been a wonderful conversation and I really would like to keep going, but uh, we've had our time. Uh, hopefully people will keep learning through some of the other sessions in this DevOps track. Thank you all. <laughs>